So good afternoon, everybody, uh, online and in reality. Um, this is so wonderful to have a hybrid um, SEBAM webinar combined with a workshop with doctoral students and emerging scholars. And we welcome our guest of honor, Professor uh, Kanefe, who happens to also be a, a dear friend. Um, if you Google her, you will see that that woman has more degrees than anybody else I know. Uh, so she's a very, very prominent scholar, um, legal scholar um, in uh, human rights, in um, um, war uh, related uh, armed conflict, that sort of thing. And today she will talk to us about um, the ethics of witnessing um, um, forced migration and doing research on forced migration. Obviously, many methodological but ethical issues are involved. So we will let um, uh, Negri say anything else she wants to tell us about herself. Um, I mentioned uh, before that she's also an artist, uh, you know, um, with exhibits uh, in many uh, different places. But maybe it negers you want to say something else about your research background, so people have a fuller picture um, than what I just said. And then we will have about forty-five minute um, talk. Um, people online can uh, ask questions in the chat. And I will monitor that. People in the classroom here can write questions on pieces of paper, the old fashioned way. And we will then um, present them to Negris for answers and continued dialogue. So without further ado, Negris, the cyberspace is yours. Thank you. Um, it's great pleasure to be here again, wherever that here is. Um, and, and, and to join in hearts and minds um, of this group. I heard that, that uh, we've got people from different uh, walks of scholarship and academia, uh, which is always an added pleasure. Um, so today, what I'm going to share with you is something I've been working on the last two years, and um, <clears throat> it will take the form of both an interactive um, a web tool as well as a, a, a monograph in the form of a manifesto. So I'll share some parts of uh, some of the ideas I developed um, concerning where we start, the kind of research uh, we do uh, on issues that are related to um, mass political violence, state criminality, uh, human suffering, and um, not just ad hoc but structural forms of education um, uh, of human dignity um, in various societies. So what I'd like to do is today, first of all, give you a methodological background as to where I'm coming from, and then share with you, as the organizers uh, wisely requested, um, some examples of how to go about uh, in terms of actualizing the approach that uh, <clears throat> I'm advocating. In terms of uh, my, my own background as a scholar um, and um, as, as a person, I suppose, I've been, uh, quote unquote, in the field for the last 30 or so years, um, working in different parts of the world um, and also engaging with a group activities in terms of um, you know, post-war or post-conflict situations, um, <clears throat> two sides of the conflict um, coming together, trying to come up with a narrative uh, that is conducive to peacemaking or transitional justice. And um, in some cases, I've worked with groups uh, whereby the conflict was very new to me. I had to learn it uh, from colleagues. And then I had to learn the histories of um, attempted reconciliation attempts. Um, and, 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 and yet uh, some of these conflicts to this day continue and sometimes escalating. So um, one of the things that I would like to share with our younger colleagues is that most of the subject matter that we deal with as uh, scholars and researchers mm, who work in the field of rights violations, state criminality, and uh, systemic violence, many of these cannot be resolved in the short run. 
and likely uh -huh. you will not see it being resolved during your lifetime. So it's really, really important um, to start uh, with, a, with a, 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 a kind of wisdom that requires patience, that requires respect to the circumstance. And um, though advocating uh, policy solutions are commendable, there is no guarantee that without the actual political background, these could uh, hold and times change in societies. What was agreeable 10 years ago in one setting may not be agreeable um, <clears throat> later on. And you might be at a loss in terms of um, not being a party to the actual conflict, then you might wonder, you know, it, it kind of had um, resonance then, why does it not make sense now, or why are the parties not agreeable anymore? Um, well, that's the nature of political life, and when there's organized conflict, often the stakes are very high. So the beginning point uh, for me, and then it's easier <clears throat> for me at my age, um, I'm in my mid fifties, um, is, is humility. Scholarship uh, equips you with perspective, with knowledge, with understanding, um, but hopefully <clears throat> with experience comes increased humility in terms of our position and the capabilities we have as observers and as witnesses. So <clears throat> this um, discussion will be on ethics of witnessing, and I advocate is uh, that it's a form of responsibility in relation to doing scholarly work in areas concerning human vulnerabilities, historical injustices, dispossessed populations, marginalized groups, mass political crimes, and, and, and long-term structural violence. It is my conviction that scholarly work has to be more aggressively engaged with socially embedded and politically potent processes of violence, injustice, dispossession, and institutionalization of these, uh, and thus normalization of these. And in this quest, um, I advocate a critical approach to scholarship as witnessing, because often in such situations, it is not possible to intervene, and it is not possible to become a party. Rather, the best you can do is witness. And witnessing is uh, an act that comes with a, a great breadth. Um, and, and in my view, there are certain methods that we need to adhere to, to fulfill that responsibility rightfully. And witnessing then lends us a particularly sharp tool for developing an accurate understanding of both the structural causes and the consequences of the violent phenomena um, that is under investigation, because part of <clears throat> the politics of violence um, leads to circumstances where evidence is lost and narratives are suppressed. And as we do know from movements of forced migration, uh, migration populations who are most vulnerable are often exiled or cleansed. And therefore the best witness that could have been is either dead or no longer there. And as a result, the scholar assumes an added responsibility in terms of filling the gaps and understanding the silences left behind those people who either perished or have been exiled and dispossessed. Um, there are various approaches concerning witnessing. Obviously, there's a long history of critical ethnography, including uh, legal ethnography. Um, uh, there's an approach called radical ethics of care, <clears throat> and there's a lot of work done in forced migration field for that. And I'll explain some of these um, uh, with examples. There's action research, uh, and then there are methods of relational comparison. Um, these provide us ample tools for reconfiguring um, our existing research methodologies. It's not that current research methodologies are lacking, but for the most part, the kind of training we provide at the higher education institutions tends to be about either theories or <clears throat> in terms of quantification, how to collect data, how to do interviews, and ethics in enters into the picture in terms of showing enough respect and putting safeguards uh, concerning human interaction. The kind of ethics I'm talking about is rather different. It is positionality towards a society 
uh, in terms of what we know, what we can know, and what we disseminate. Um, and then therefore, <clears throat> the kind of methodology that I'm advocating actually encourages a grounded approach to social, moral, and political problems at large when you're dealing with active conflict and or post-conflict situations. And, and <clears throat> this kind of scholarship invites the scholar researcher to focus directly on the structural and historical reasons for mass injustices and rely on the idea of a relational self uh, in terms of one's positionality. So it is an engagement and it embodies a market form of responsibility in terms of responding and, and, and it rests on the shoulders of not just the student but also the scholar and the educator. So uh, it very much is in my mind, a team effort, it's a continuation. Uh, it's not something that one can do alone, uh, <clears throat> but it requires scholarly communities um, that train and appreciate this kind of approach um, as well as um, envisage um, new spaces for that kind of work to be published and, and disseminated. So, <clears throat> I, have, I am trained as an international law scholar um, in a particular school of thought, which is called TWEL, is Third World Approaches to International Law. Um, it is a hybrid form of scholarship, but one of the main tenets of this kind of legal scholarship is to consider uh, <clears throat> legal thinking and, and legal research um, as praxis. And so in that sense, the, the, the notion of engaging uh, with knowledge production to intervene, uh, to challenge and to induce possible change uh, is part of my legal training, as well as um, about two decades uh, prior um, being trained <clears throat> as a historian slash uh, political theorist who worked with war and, and forced migration, I already innately knew that my positionality came with a lot of responsibility, but the legal training um, somehow sharpened that focus as far as I'm concerned in terms of what do we consider as material worthy of, um, of, of knowledge production, worthy of investigation. And, and I'm going to share some of these with you as well in terms of options that, that you can utilize for your own work. Um, so an in-depth knowledge of consequential aspects of research practices, <clears throat> I believe could lead to a, a more engaged understanding of uh, our situation, as well as um, <clears throat> the, the peculiar societal and political dynamics. So one of the um, critical aspects of scholarship as praxis is to contextualize what you're looking at. And um, often contemporary university does not necessarily allow us to do that. They become experts in one particular field and that's where we shine and we get all the training that's needed to that particular field of expertise. Um, so the only exception to that kind of compartmentalization has been the, the, the recent uh, resurgence of intersectionality, right? So intersectionality brings together race, class, gender, um, ethnicity, religion, um, uh, in, 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 in a kind of um, in, interrelated uh, format uh, for us to be informed about the, 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 the position of the, subject, the subjects that, that we're um, trying to understand um, the, the life and then the suffering of and um, it, it brings a multi-dimensional approach to the way we unpack uh, problem cases but above and beyond that uh, for the most part disciplines tend to, to di di create divides and one of the things that uh, perhaps legal scholarship is privileged um, in terms of uh, scholarship as practice is, is legal scholarship <clears throat> I can entertain um, different forms of engagement with economics, with politics, but always from the legal lens. And therefore, um, the divisions are less sharp um, in terms of um, where you focus, as long as uh, you remain within the legal framework and critical framework. Um, now, this may not be applicable if you're studying sociology, if you're studying politics, if you're studying anthropology, um, <clears throat> but even those disciplines 
for the last 40 years or so have become quite hybrid and they speak to each other. And uh, one of the suggestions I make is, let's say if your entry point is forced migration, if your entry point is um, ethnic cleansing or mass violence, um, that entry point actually allows you uh, to benefit from the riches of various disciplines in your work. Um, so rather than starting with the discipline, um, at least my inclination has been start with the entry point, start with the question itself, and then use whatever you can to get yourself closer to understanding what's going on on the ground. Now, here is the, the a paradox of impossibility. If you're, uh, quote unquote, studying and researching a, a war or conflict situation, the situation itself is fluid. The situation itself has historical roots and the situation itself has an uncertain future. So how could you produce scholarship with certainty on something that is on the move, that is fluid, um, <clears throat> that is affected by so many variants that you, with all the knowledge and training that you can master, um, cannot get to the bottom of at any given time because tomorrow or the next month, likely many things will change again. Um, there comes the point of um, uh, scholarly humility, and then this is something that goes back to ancient Greek, uh, Greek Greeks actually, um, there is no finite amount of knowledge that you can acquire, um, what you can <clears throat> share uh, with your community, with, with colleagues, with the larger society, is, is, is an understanding of the dynamics, the patterns, the frame, um, and, and, and perhaps uh, if you're lucky enough, um, to get your data on, 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 on <clears throat> to get your data um, in, 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 a, in a way that is uh, presentable and uh, uh, Elsvieta does a superb job in that, um, collecting very difficult forms of data, then perhaps at that point in time, uh, you can provide a critical picture of what is happening, but with no certainty that it will stay that way because what we're talking about is human conflict. What we're talking about is societal and, and political um, <clears throat> tension um, that is mass scale and institutionalized. And, and therefore you can identify a certain turning points, certain dynamics, but um, even as a historian, something that happened, let's say, 40 years ago, something that happened, let's say, 100 years ago, such as the Armenian genocide, to this day, um, <clears throat> there is debate about how many died, where, under what circumstances. So one of the things that we have to accept when we're dealing with conflict and war and state criminality and mass violence is that we will always see only a part of the picture. And so the responsibility is double in the sense that there'll always be things that we will be omitting. Um, in the very least, the accounts of the people who are no longer there, as I said, who perished, uh, will not be included other than testimonials and memoirs and some, um, some kind of um, <clears throat> documentation of who they are and what happened to them. Um, so, so there is, if, if you position yourself with the hope that you're going to get to the bottom of it, you're going to have the exact picture of what happened there and then, that's not going to happen with conflict. Um, it, what will happen is you'll join a conversation. And then this is another thing that I, <clears throat> I am advocating um, in the kind of uh, legal research and uh, social political research myself and, and my students are doing, um, join the conversation and realize that when an issue is really timely and really bothersome and, 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 and when the trouble is so deep cutting, likely there'll be many people who are working on this. And so accept um, their company accept scholarship um, that is on related subjects and not just in references, but seriously sit down and read where they're coming from and what they read and, and what kind of work they did in the field and what kind of data they use because a lot of the actual training uh, happens through reading and relating to other people who work in the field. This is not a competition. This is not a rally. And, and, and this, is, this is, I mean, it, it, it requires an understanding that big problems of our times obviously will catch the attention of um, groups of people. And so notwithstanding one's desire to be original and to say something new, and that's really important, uh, it is equally important to understand that 
um, the more there are voices that are joining uh, in a similar conversation, including yours, the more likely that, <clears throat> that the violence and, and the atrocity and the, the, the mass conflict um, will basically see the light of the day uh, sooner than later. And then perhaps there'll be a society transformation in terms of understanding why it happened and how it cannot be repeated. Um, so <clears throat> true engagement with this kind of praxis oriented scholarship, um, I think it's important that um, we look at practice as taking ownership um, of insights, problem assessments, problem solving skills, um, as they relate to urgent social and political issues on the ground. Why do I say urgent? Um, because we are dealing with mass conflict, we're dealing with violence. There is an urgency to it. Um, you might argue that um, a particular health problem or urban decay is also urgent. Yes, but in our area of expertise, it is really life and death. It is really people drowning and disappearing. It is really people perishing on the border. It is really people <clears throat> being there one day on the Google map as it happened with the Sri Lankan assault on Tamils. And um, then, you know, two days later, um, um, it's not there anymore. So, <clears throat> so there is a certain urgency and that actually um, basically provides what we call the political ontology. Um, of our work, which is related to existential threats to the society. Um, and, and so when you're dealing with the aftermath of war, crisis, turmoil, upheaval, dispossession, mass violence, um, you're decoding forms of how legal and societal action um, led to these uh, consequences. Um, you're also trying to understand social hierarchies and regulation of violence. Uh, and no society likes to be gutted like this. So likely your efforts might be well received by victim populations, but um, they may not be so well received by the society at large. Even in transitional justice studies, um, <clears throat> not all societies are so keen on revisiting the past. And, and in particular issues related to mass mobility and right of return, are very con con controversial. So displacement is always a problem for those who left and for those who remain behind um, because there is a desire for those who left to come back and there may be a desire for those who re re remained uh, for the ones who were dispossessed not to come back. So although the conflict might have ended on paper, the conflict actually continues um, <clears throat> throughout the, the, the historical unfolding of displacement. Uh, and then it leads to newer kinds of conflicts uh, through resettlement, um, through border policies, um, through denial of membership, um, through diaspora politics. And it leads to multiplication of uh, perspectives in terms of what was the violence and who was suffering. Um, and then again, I'm gonna go back to my call for um, a very engaged and, and, and situated knowledge production and that comes with human humility, not just scholarly, because when you're dealing with something that involves the whole society, although you might be concentrating on the victims themselves, um, you still need to develop the ability to understand the economic, the historical, the political background to the issues. And that's awful lot of learning and engagement. And that's part of the responsibility not to compartmentalize the victims, not just to look at victimhood, but contextualize it so that it could actually have a societal meaning. Uh, formal and informal practices should be included in terms of how structure came about, how uh, structural violence came about, and how <clears throat> specific categories of victims victim emerged, and how these are perceived both by the ones who remain behind and the ones who are on the move. Um, so, what I want to then talk about is what's called dialectics of positionality in your scholarship. In a historically interconnected world <clears throat> where social, political, and economic developments have strong global dimensions, um, strengthening our engagement with critical issues about the society that we're dealing with or societies we're doing comparative work 
And with the communities uh, from which we have come, uh, we will be in a better position to honor our profession, our rights, our autonomy, agency, uh, as well as showing respect to the people that we study uh, as scholars, researchers, public intellectuals and advocates. So what do I mean by that? The positionality does not mean you only study people who are of your nationality, of, of your gender, of your class background, but it, it, it means that <clears throat> um, you do not disown um, these characteristics of your own self. Uh, because you come with certain sensitivities, you, you come with a background, you, you come with the training, and um, each one of us has a certain propensity. Uh, and, and this is my claim, each one of us, us have uh, two or three main questions that we carry inside ourselves through, throughout our scholarly lives. It's, it's just that often we get to know what these are fairly later on because uh, it takes great skill and training to identify what the core question is for you. Um, so so <clears throat> you have to have this inner dialogue. So what I'm saying is, um, and this also links to what's called pedagogies of hope, your scholarship is your personal affair as well as being a societal and political responsibility. You have to have this inner dialogue you have to have this inner conflict with yourself sometimes about what kind of world do you want? What would you like to see at the end of this conflict if it was up to you? Because you consciously or unconsciously actually entertain these ideas. And, and so it's really, really important for you to be aware of your own philosophical position and, 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 and your um, articulated or, or otherwise innate desires uh, for let's say coexistence, uh, for a different kind of history. I don't suggest that you re reflect these on your on your work directly, um, but they always show up. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you an example um, from myself. When I um, finished my uh, uh, PhD in social and political thought, um, it was an immensely um, bulky work. It was like, what, 550 pages or so. It was on uh, <clears throat> a Greek uh, Turkish population exchange and um, a forced, forced population exchanges from their onwards. And it had a whole um, debate on um, theories of justice and, and, and nationalism as utopia and whatnot. And, you know, my supervisor at the defense said, you're going to suffer for this. Um, and then I said, okay, you know, I knew I was going to suffer. And my external, as he started the examination, said to me, and obviously to the jury, so why do you care about this? And I thought, how do I answer such a thing? He says, I really want to know why do you care about this? And I started explaining why it was important to understand these events and how they were providing a background for future forced migration movements in the region, um, the, the ethnic purity arguments. And then he, 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 he kind of said, okay, so why should I care about it? And I thought, what exactly is he asking me? Um, he was Joseph Cairns, by the way, a very well-known political theorist. And then I understood he was actually asking me about what was my theory of justice? Did I, did I want to see history written differently? Did I want it to be remembered differently with the hope that maybe the future of the society would not repeat the same mistakes? And this is exactly why I cared about it and why he should care about it. And from there onwards, the defense uh, <clears throat> moved on uh, like a dream because we had a real conversation. But, but it was so hard, you know, for the five years of the PhD, I, I wasn't cognizant of the fact that my positionality was so deeply entrenched in my own refugee identity. Four branches of my family are actually up, up, uprooted and, and, and they each have uh, traumatic dispossession histories, right? And, and as growing up, I think I watched a society wherever I was slightly from the margin wondering how the other people see themselves. They certainly didn't see themselves like I did or my family did. And then I was wondering about the world at large. And I'm not saying carry your childhood to your, to your scholarship, but there, there was that moment there when I recognized that, okay, this is the pivot. 
that's what keeps me moving. It's not just trying to understand who did what to whom and how people suffered and how the states condone that violence. But it's more about, I think I would like to see a different kind of society in the Middle East, in the Balkans, and then I'd like to do something about it, right? So, so for you, it would be something else. And it might sound very mundane at first. It might sound almost, I don't know, uh, too simplistic. Don't be, don't be afraid of <clears throat> having crystal clear desires. Um, and you don't have to um, somehow orchestrate them into your work, but it's important that you know it because it will, it will be the engine that moves you to go to places that um, where the angels uh, fear to tread. Um, because the kind of work we do with historical violence and, and political uh, conflict is, is, is actually, um, it's not always safe work. And uh, my colleagues know that I had <clears throat> to change passports. I had to go um, and, and write under pseudonyms. Um, I had to protect my children uh, 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 from surveillance because of the work I was doing. And I am not an important person. I'm not an important person, but it doesn't take too much for a state or uh, a dominant group uh, to take umbrage. And to think that you're unearthing things that the public should not necessarily have access to. And you're publishing internationally things that would actually tarnish the reputation of those people. And it doesn't have to be the, the country that you have nationality in. It could be India, um, and I'm not Indian, and, and it could be Germany, right? So it's very easy to, when you're doing this kind of work uh, to get the ire of the state or uh, nationalist or fundamentalist groups. So, so it's not <clears throat> um, the kind of work um, that let's say um, would not affect you in any way directly. So your ethical responsibility um, in terms of doing your work um, and, and academic integrity um, also comes with a certain risk of personal danger. And the awareness of your positionality and understanding that you are actually an actor. You are actually a political actor, whether you like it or not. Um, you are producing knowledge. You're up, up, you know, turning uh, history upside down sometimes. You're introducing new narratives to discussion. Um, it can make you a target, um, but even if it doesn't, um, it also allows you to think that this is not something you can do willy nilly. Um, because it really directly affects uh, people's lives. So <clears throat> witnessing as responsibility. Um, we know that during 20th century, witnessing outgrew uh, its original affiliations with legal evidence and, and became pretty much a social vocation in its own right. Um, the ethical redefinition of witnessing advanced by um, social theorists such as Jean-Francois Lyotard, Shoshana Felman, uh, Georgia Gumben, Hannah Arendt, the list goes on uh, on, on and on, and, and it comes uh, <clears throat> with uh, the, the kind of possibility um, of speaking different kinds of truths. Because the idea is that by speaking the truth of uh, a witness, um, you are actually articulating something that other people didn't see or didn't notice or they didn't know. So it's meant to be a game changer and it's meant to open up a wound and it's meant to bring up injustices to the surface. So as it is, it's politically very challenging as an act. So when you do that in the form of scholarship, um, as you're aware, we don't just write books and articles, but we teach, we lecture, we educate, and we educate generation after generation if you're actually employed at the university or if you're a popular writer or a lecturer, you speak to crowds, you have expert position in the society. So you have a crucial uh, engagement uh, with the society at large. And, and sometimes that overlaps with institutional platforms. Um, and sometimes you're brought in as legal expert. And, and therefore, um, witnessing as responsibility really can become a real legal responsibility. And I know that from years of working as a, an expert witness uh, for uh, refugee files that the, who were arriving from Middle East, um, and then I needed to contextualize the, the, the claim that the asylum seeker was making. 
And <clears throat> it, it is a very, very heavy responsibility um, because if you don't do a good job, if it's an, a genuine claim and if you don't do a good job, you're basically risking the life of that person or the family. Um, and on the other hand, if it's a bogus kind of claim, which can happen sometimes, um, then, I mean, you have to make a choice then, um, whether you withdraw yourself or, or, or whether um, <clears throat> you write a, an expert a witness report um, that introduces questions to, to the investigation or inquiry, whatever it is. But for the most part, you're dealing with uh, unrepresentable uh, events that are the underbelly of uh, formal history, that are uh, the unspoken part of the politics of a nation. And you're dealing with crimes that are of uh, egregious nature. <clears throat> and no one wants to know about them. And most of these crimes and most of those acts um, go with impunity. Um, they do not um, correspond to accountability, especially in past historical instances. Uh, the more you <clears throat> unravel, the more you're honored, the more uncomfortable the state or the society will become because they want it to be a part of the past. So either way, um, you will be really engaging with stuff um, that makes you quite visible and you will need to live uh, with the consequences of that. So <clears throat> on that note, I just wanna mention very briefly what we call ped pedagogies of hope uh, and how it relates to witnessing. So at the graduate level of education, um, capitalizing like I do, the scholar's responsibility as a wit witness must aim at tackling um, the conundrums and difficulties of scholarly research, uh, but also maximizing its potential and uh, highlighting its benefits for institutional and social change and tracing and teaching its most adequate and resonant forms. So <clears throat> as an educator, I think it's my responsibility in this instance, not to teach only how to critique, but also to teach how to intervene and how to become a party in the sense that not to the conflict, but how to become a party to knowledge production at the institutional level and at the societal level. So for instance, um, you have to be very careful about the documentation. You have to be very careful about methodologies. You have to be very careful about your geographies, um, <clears throat> the interlocutors that you have. And you should be able to defend uh, your findings, uh, either historically or currently, um, in terms of respecting the, the dignity and rights of those who are involved. Um, as well as sometimes going counter to established narratives. And for that, you really need to be trained very, very strongly um, in, in field work and methodologies, as well as historical and legal scholarship. So what looks like footwork, you know, the methods course that most students hate taking or, you know, legal writing courses at law school, you need those skills because you are not going to stay in the university, you're going to go out. I mean, university is part of the, the, the larger world, but nonetheless, you'll be dealing with groups and people and communities and some, sometimes movements and politicians who are not fit, friendly to your findings and, and, and your strength and the possibility of <clears throat> leveraging your research will then come from uh, how strongly positioned you are in terms of your methods, your data, in terms of the historical documentation, in terms of the legal precedents that, that you can unearth. And uh, <clears throat> it is a legitimate form of activity for you to ask questions and, and um, acquire information. And that is uh, particularly important in legal work, but, but, but also in, in social scientific work. Um, I remember at one point, I'll give you an example from the field um, that must have been during 1990s. And we knew that <clears throat> back then the um, Turkish government, um, right after the, the division in Cyprus, um, was engaged in a massive onslaught and uprooting and dispossession against Kurds in Turkey in Southeast um, of the country. And there were boats that were taking off uh, from the, the, the pier of Mersin, which is right ac across from Cyprus. And <clears throat> these dispossessed Kurds um, and their villages were burned and, 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 and people were disappearing. They were uh, shuffled into these boats and they were taken to 
to the, the Turkish Cypriot part of Cyprus. And they were given uh, temporary residential permits, per, uh, permits and they were given uh, Greek Cypriot lands. We knew that on the ground, um, and I knew that in terms of the frequency and the numbers um, that are entering, but how could I ascertain that this narrative was accurate? Because this was something that was denied by both the Turkish Cypriot government at the time and then also Turkish government. Turkish government denied it because they didn't want to acknowledge that there was mass disposition and village burning and displacement against Kurds. The Turkish Cypriot government didn't want to acknowledge that they were is receiving <clears throat> boatfuls of um, um, people with Turkish nationality and settling them on, on Tur Greek Cypriot land. None of the none of the parties involved wanted to talk about it, and the refugees themselves, the Kurds, certainly didn't want to talk about it because they were already under the gun. And so <clears throat> I had to attend a, a number of training sessions with the State uh, Department of Demographics, and I needed to get data um, <clears throat> that looked at um, population change in, in in hamlets in Cyprus, and I couldn't get straight data, so I wanted to look at um, the changes in, in, in classroom sizes at uh, primary schools, because I knew that most of the people moving uh, were actually women and children. And as I began to gather the data, and then I was also trying to get similar data uh, <clears throat> from the Turkey side of things, uh, somebody um, woke up in the department uh, that I was dealing with. And she said to me, what you're doing is, is far too dangerous. I don't recommend you continue collecting this data because they knew what it could be used for. I mean, it was like very solid data that actually showed a specific kind of population transfer that was orchestrated, right? And um, <clears throat> so I, sh I shared some, some of this data with some Greek Cypriot friends and um, I think I published one piece um, uh, on it and I kind of um, decided, no, I'm gonna wait because there's another round of elections and whatnot. But um, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. You can get closer to what is considered as dangerous data, um, but don't think that the authorities don't know. Don't think they don't understand. The state knows. The state is always, this is my claim about Syrian refugees as well. When my book came out on Syrian exodus, um, I think I angered some people uh, among colleagues and I said, the, the, the state is always two, three steps ahead of us because they're the ones who are accepting these refugees. They're the ones who are resettling them. They are the ones who are choosing the sectors in the economy. They already know. We are trying to discover what they already know. And, and, and in a way it is because we're talking about politically orchestrated moves of dispossession. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a whole thing about witnessing under turmoil, um, secondary trauma, um, uh, political engagement, how do you deal with society-wide oppression? Um, how can you actually establish networks of solidarity and alliance so that you don't go in there alone. This is really, really important. I can't overemphasize this. If you're doing this kind of work, don't go alone. Always link up with people who do similar work. If you have a supervisor, make sure that you are connected with their colleagues wherever you're going in the field. And you also are connected to human rights lawyers and a network. Do not go there thinking you're going to discover the, the, the beautiful truth about this particular trauma. First of all, this particular trauma often is not beautiful. And secondly, when you discover certain things, it will lead to the benefit of many a people who are still alive. So you will be a target. And, and, and in order for that not to happen, it needs to be known that you're situated, you're not going out there alone. And that is part of your responsibility towards yourself if you're going to assume a witnessing role. Um, similar um, <clears throat> kind of caution applies um, when you're dealing with legal documentation. Uh, you might get your hands on case data. You might get your hands on files. I once dealt with um, interviews. Uh, I was part of a, a small group um, that collected torture testimonies. Um, and um, the idea was to use them um, in a reconciliation process, um, but there was great risk to the people who actually gave the testimonies. 
and I suggested to my colleagues that um, <clears throat> back then we were doing recordings that we take them out of the country. We take them out and then, and, and, and basically um, keep them, store them somewhere else. And uh, it's as if someone heard what I was saying. As soon as we took these recordings out of 80 or so people, very detailed torture testimonies, um, the, 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 the leading uh, researcher of the group uh, was jailed and he still is in jail. And, and the rest of the group was arrested and, and their office was plundered, right? So, so, I mean, many a time, even though the stuff that you have your hands on, whether it's gray literature, whether it's lost files, whether it's testimonies, even though it's legitimate, uh, even though there's nothing illegal about it, if it's posing a direct challenge or if it's a threat to the establishment, to the status quo, um, don't count on being able to hold on to it. You always have to double it, back up, remove it. And, and, and at this age of um, <clears throat> internet, these things are easier, um, but at the same time, it doesn't make it any easier to publish these testimonies without necessarily tarnishing the lives of the people who gave these testimonies. To this day, we're waiting. We're waiting on that data. What it allows us to know is how a certain system of incarceration and detention worked and how disappearances happened. Um, but can we publish it widely? Yes, some do, but those are actually asylum seekers and refugees outside and they cannot go back to the country about which they're publishing this data. So, <clears throat> and I don't want to scare you about the kind of work you're doing, but that's the reality of the kind of work we're doing. Um, and in my, in my larger work, and I know I'm almost out of time in terms of talking, uh, I talk about affect-based learning. Um, I talk about vulnerability and fragility, uh, <clears throat> both in terms of the communities we work with, but also in terms of the scholarly community. Um, it's not unknown, and it's not unknown in Poland either, uh, when you engage in system-challenging work, uh, you might be ousted from the institution yourself. Your family can become under threat. You might actually lose your livelihood. You may not find a publisher. And if you go abroad, you may not be able to come back and teach and lecture and then reach to the student body uh, who is in your native um, And so, so you have to be very vigilant and you have to understand that the context of death, disappearance, displacement and dispossession also tangentially and sometimes directly affect the people who are working on it. And it's not a form of voyeurism what we do. It is real responsibility and it comes um, <clears throat> with the kind of danger um, that is imminent to the situation itself. Um, I am looking down at some more of my notes and I've got um, some examples about the uh, tools of the trade and how you collect data, what constitutes data, how you decipher first-hand experiences and testimonies. Um, how you categorize violence, how you speak to uh, silences. Um, all that perhaps we can talk about um, if there are specific questions. And I promise to this uh, wonderful audience that once this um, piece is completed, I'll share, I'll share them with Elspeth and Isabella and, and, and hopefully they'll share it with you. Uh, I think I'm over my time. Well, thank you, Nengris. As always, you know, you give us so much food for thought that it's very difficult to even imagine where we start. But I think this was for at least for the audience that I can see <laughs> in um, in my room here. Uh, this is very important and also jives with some of the issues that we have been talking about last night and this morning, especially on positionality. Um, you know, um, on maybe at some point you want to also say something as a legal scholar, what kind of data you were uh, collecting and you alluded to many you know, case files, legal documents, that kind of stuff. But perhaps we can elaborate on that because it, at least in the room, we have mainly social scientists who rely on interviews and on field research solely. But I think it'd be very interesting to maybe engage in a conversation on how that kind of empirical data can be married, if you will, with you know the, more of the legal um, uh, perspective and, and that sort of thing. But I've invited people on the chat to put your questions in the chat. Uh, and if we have questions in the room, now it's the time. 
or forever hold your peace. <laughs> so any, anybody has any questions? You can either come here and speak to the computer or you can say it here and I will rely it to Nergis. Um, come on, let's have a, a, a discussion. Uh, do you want me to try uh, your question while people are typing their questions? Hopefully? Sure. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> so in terms of legal scholarship, um, when you're dealing with cases that are um, the underbelly of the legal system, right, the dark chambers of the legal system, detention cases, disappearance cases, um, uh, summary discretion cases, um, <clears throat> extradition cases, torture cases, um, the kinds of legal practices that lead to um, <clears throat> the, 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 the dispossession of whole communities and, and cleansing of land and livestock and, and um, taking away of children, um, uh, denial of citizenship rights, uh, when you're talking about settled minorities, many of these require that you find a backdoor. Um, but in, in, in a nutshell, what I'm going to say may not appeal to people. And uh, from the outset, uh, often I had my colleagues from social science departments telling me, what are you doing with the Minister of Interior? <laughs> and I'm like, well, because I need to know, you know, where they keep these things and I need to know how they justify what kind of routine explanation they provide. So you actually have to work with the state officers. You have to work with the judges. You have to work with the police. And by work, what I mean is let them talk. Uh, in every country, there is a Freedom of Information Act. And in every country, there are emergency measures. In every country, there are uh, extenuating circumstances where you'll be denied uh, these um, <clears throat> documents and files and reports. But there are other ways of going in. So I remember one time we wanted to look at uh, detention houses uh, um, with a senior colleague of mine in Turkey um, because they were just mushrooming um, and they were housing hundreds and hundreds of people, not just from Syria, but from Afghanistan, from Iraq, um, from all of the Middle East. And <clears throat> there was a state ban in terms of any kind of research being done in, in the vicinity of these detention houses. And um, so my colleague and I decided uh, we're gonna approach it um, uh, in terms of documenting the provisions made by the state. So we're gonna make it um, palatable for state officers to give us access. Does that mean you can have lengthy interviews with the people who are detained there? No, but at least you can enter, you can see the building, you can see how people are kept. Um, and, and so for that to happen, you have to work uh, along with the state. And in terms of interviews, expert witness accounts, reports, case documents, um, testimonies, and, and other for, for, forms of direct uh, records, you then have to have access to victim groups. And some of these, um, <clears throat> for instance, in, in minority situations, uh, are in the diaspora in exile. And I mean, in, in the work, I have a whole section about building trust. Um, Look, if you were <clears throat> a, a diaspora member, let's say um, you were exiled from Poland, and, and let's say um, your family was killed, and let's say you have no right of return, and, and, and uh, you have very traumatic memories and, and bitter memories, and you're trying to rebuild your life elsewhere. So all of a sudden, I come knocking at your door and I say, excuse me, I'd like to talk about you know, the experiences of Polish refugees. Why should she let me in? I mean, why why should she let me in into your into your you know the, the secrets of your hearts um, and, and 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 troubled souls and memories and your memories? Uh, why? I have to give you a solid reason. I can't just tell you, well, I'm writing a dissertation on it. That's not enough, good enough a reason when you're dealing with political trauma and violence. You need to actually establish yourself as reputable and as trustworthy. And there's whole debate about what do you do when you collect your data? So testimonies, uh, life events, um, <clears throat> chronologies, legal documentation. So you can have access to legal documentation that these people brought with them, uh, which then proves their case that they were dispossessed and exiled. 
um, and you can take copies and you can you can basically build a beautiful legal historical treatise about how this particular moment of disposition uh, took place. And you can publish your book. Um, will you remember to send a copy to the people who provided these data to you? Um, and will you be able to enter Poland after publishing that? So the, these are some of the side effects of getting your hands on legal data, which is gray data, or which is banned data, or um, con the contentious data. And the, the politics of publishing, when the conflict is ongoing, and I think Elspieta could really speak to that, um, it, it is not a game. It is a real life matter. Um, it can put communities under danger. It could put you under danger. The, the more legally binding the data that that you're unearthing and circulating, uh, the more likely uh, that it will have rep repercussions. Well, thank you. We have uh, several questions that I think are a good follow-up too. So I have two questions from Isabella and one question from Pani Justyna um, on, online. I will start with Pani Isabella's question and it's very personal. So you talked about uh, you know, uh, how we go into the field, how we get interested in something. And Pani Isabella is asking, uh, what are your grand questions that you find the most important to answer in your research? Uh, or Snoopy? I, <laughs> no, no, I, you know, I, I, I thought a lot about it the last five years, partially because, um, you know, when you prepare, prepare for full professorship, you have to give this life story of why you've done this and, and how your work relates to your previous work and what you intend to do in the future. And I think my question is very simple. It's a very ugly question. Very, very ugly question. How do we do such horrific things to each other and then go on as if nothing happened? How do we do it? How do we do it institutionally? How do we do it socially? How do we do it politically? How do we normalize mass violence? How do we um, not pretend, but sometimes don't even remember or even relate? How do we build um, <clears throat> shopping malls and graveyards? How do, we, how do we repossess people's livelihoods and streets and um, you know, houses of prayer and, and, and their children? And, as, as, as human sociality dictates, it, it should be against the, 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 the very inner desire of, of, of surviving to go against your own kin um, in, in such an institutional way. And it's, it's more about how do we justify it? How do we justify it? And how do we sustain that narrative of justification generation after generation? And then how do we legalize it? So that's my big question, I think. Okay, so the, the second question of Isabella is very much related to you, Pani Justyna's question. So I will read both because you might want to have them uh, both in front of you. So uh, the first question is, are there topics, and you alluded some to, uh, to some of it, are there topics that you had to absolutely stop researching because uh, of fear of violence or the impossibility to publish? And the related question is in the context of where if you are conducting field research and engaging forced migrants in your research, you know, so participation capital P, um, it seems to me, uh, Pan Justyna writes that it is quite important to present your findings, even if they, are con if they contradict the official narrative of the government. So the question is how to present findings also in front of governmental officials uh, that there's censor, there might be censorship or specific approach to the government. For example, in Poland towards you know, the very anti-refugee uh, sentiment. And then the second question is, what is the best way to contribute through the research to changing of the official approach, the governmental approach? Um, I'm gonna start with the first one because the two are indeed related. Um, <clears throat> I personally went through situations where there were direct threats, um, not to me, but also to my children and to my mother. And um, at that point, I actually changed gears because I had to make a decision. Either I would never set foot in the region, um, and some people have to do make that decision. They literally do make that decision. You have to become an exile. Um, or you do that work, but you do it comparatively. 
you do it without directly pointing the finger to the state and accusing it legally. Um, you do it in, in such a way that you talk about the, the, the genome of the violence that happens here, there, and, and, and in the region, but you don't name uh, officials, for instance. That's a choice. Sometimes you can do that, uh, sometimes you can't do that. Um, and that is related to the second question very much in the sense that um, this is what I was trying to share with you. We are dealing with human politics and we're dealing with mass conflict. This is not a child's game. This is not um, um, a laboratory for us to go and observe. People are killing each other. People are literally uh, tearing communities apart, raping um, <clears throat> young, young girls. Um, people are burying children in mass. So you cannot assume you can go in there and, and gather this information from the victims and go back to the perpetrators and say, hmm, I know. We don't have that kind of position in the society. Um, what we can do is ally with others who are working um, on similar problems. And um, one of the things that I try to do is introduce uh, some of these events into the curricula that, that I'm teaching or how to publish it. That's a big question. There are certain venues where you can publish it. Um, there are certain other venues, if you publish it, it's for sure that uh, you'll be blacklisted by certain states and governments. Um, and I'm going to tell you uh, <clears throat> with a, a, a touch of um, humor. Um, I mean, in my case, some years I'm blacklisted and other years I'm not blacklisted. It depends on the sensitivities of the government. Some years what we do is of, of great danger to them and other years that issue is over and done with for them and then they concentrate on other people working on other stuff. So, so that is also fluid. If you're going through a peace negotiation period, you can write about minorities and you can write about refugees and that's all okay. But five years later, if there's a moratorium on doing that kind of work in publishing um, and then you, you've got all this work in front of you, um, well, then maybe you can publish it in another language, but maybe not in your native language, because if you do, uh, then the publisher might say, and it happened to me, they said, take that section out, take that section out, this is being uh, printed here, right, and, and, and I was angry, I said, I don't want to, and they said, well, I'm sorry, we can't take the responsibility, right, so, so I took a section out, and, and that's real life, does that mean I'm a coward? Um, maybe for some people, yes. Does that mean I stop doing this kind of work? No, I don't stop doing this kind of work. But you can't get everything you want to in the middle of a political conflict that is causing lives of, of, of hundreds and thousands of people. We are not special in the eyes of the state. And, and I think there's an understanding that because of our training and our position in, in the society, when we speak, people will listen to. Sometimes they do, and other times they listen to to take caution and to silence us. And that's the other part of the story. So you're not always gonna be, li be listened to with respect. Sometimes you're gonna be listened to um, <clears throat> so that the state takes note of what your opponents know about and what they're working on, and then develops a counter discourse. Does that Sorry. make sense? Um, maybe you can tackle the, the last one because I'm not sure how detailed we were about all of this. How, you know, they're young, aspiring scholars and they want to change the world. <laughs> so from, from your perspective, what would be some of the strategies to uh, really have an impact and influence in some way, you know, the authorities or the evil people <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's that sort of thing. You have any words of wisdom on that? So they don't quite go away the um, you know, idealistic, um, this thing is. Playing up? <clears throat> yeah, please. Uh, yeah, can, can you hear me? Okay, so um, speak, speak in public. Uh, when you're invited uh, to small groups, communities. There are venues I spoke 
or like wedding places or like cultural association anniversaries. You know, um, and, and you might think, oh, a serious scholar wouldn't go to places like that. On the contrary, go and, and listen to people um, <clears throat> and, 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 and speak to young children, speak to, to the elderly, the survivors. If you're invited to a government consultation, don't turn your nose away. I never do. I had to go and train uh, police officers um, <clears throat> in anti-torture methodology. And some of these were historically involved in torture practices. And I went in with my blood curdling, but I went in because that's that interface. Get out of the academia, be out there, um, write editorials, publish in different venues, write blogs, um, <clears throat> give interviews, um, give your name to the media as expert. And I, I'm quite surprised people who know nothing about what I do um, because in the Middle East, sometimes I give newspaper in interviews and a, a, a mentor of mine told me that. And I'm like, why should I do that? And he said to me, you know what? You won't believe how many people would read that compared to how many people read your books. And indeed, like people will actually recognize me from that damn newspaper article, which talks about um, emigre life in such and such place or, or, or what happens to you um, when you survive political trauma. They recognize you, they ask you questions. So there's a whole public out there. Um, does that mean it diminishes your ability as a scholar? I don't think so. I think it actually makes you much more rooted and it allows you to interact with different communities. So that's one way. Uh, the other thing I would suggest, not so much words of wisdom, um, because if I was wise, I would use them myself, but um, keep doing what you do. You may not be able to publish it. You might be turned down. Uh, your committee members may not understand what exactly you're at, but remember, this is your life, your project. You are investing yourself in it. You're not trying to prove yourself to, to, to a group only. I mean, academic training has that portion. But at the end of the day, you're actually investing yourself in your life. So keep doing it. Don't give up on it. Um, one of the things that happens when you finish your PhD, and all of us live through it, it's an anti-climax. You finish it and you go, because you spend five, six years, it's done. You try to look for a publisher, you look for a postdoc, but you're like, what do I do now? Well, keep doing, keep asking new questions, go back to your work. It's lifetime work. Scholarship is uh, a life choice. It's not a career choice only. It's a life choice. It's a way of living, asking, breathing. So, so don't be discouraged when your work doesn't get published. Don't be discouraged when you are torn to pieces by your critiques, which is going to happen. And <clears throat> if you're wise enough, you learn how to shoulder it and, and how to take it on and, and how to respond gracefully, right? So these are very essential skills so that you, you don't lose your idealism, but at the same time, you keep going. Look at it. We get trained, I, I calculated the other day, uh, about 30 years or so we get trained. It's awful lot of time, right? And then we start working full time in our late twenties, early thirties. And we work 35 years on the same subject. And we are meant to create new ideas for 35 years. Some of us work for- Don't depress them. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is you have to love what you're doing for that kind of longevity. And that's the beauty of scholarship. When you do something for that long with that kind of commitment, surely you add to the society. Mm -hmm. So we have one more question, and this is actually a very interesting one. Um, so this is from a, um, one of our participants who is both a scholar of um, human trafficking, but also an activist, works for an NGO. And so her question is, how do you reconcile the goals of mine, you know, the scholar slash NGO worker, with the goals of law enforcement, for example, border control, fr Frontex, when they are so dramatically different. Mm -hmm. So what should be happening there? And also how we 
can combine these two perspectives and, and these two, uh, two approaches. Because uh, you, you emphasize in your talk, uh, Negris, that we should speak to them, even if maybe they are the evildoers and, <laughs> and our enemies. So what's your advice to this young person here? Right. I mean, first of all, I don't think there are enemies, and most of them don't think they're doing evil. Most of them are bureaucrats. <clears throat> so, so there's like a whole different mindset in terms of representing the state and doing their job. And many of them genuinely believe that they're uh, protecting the society and their family members. Some of them really have a totalitarian tendencies, and uh, but but <clears throat> on the whole, um, they're members of the society. Um, in terms of reconciling our positions, um, I don't think in many instances it's possible to reconcile. I think they know it and we know it. And, and I think the best that can happen is um, nobody tries to kill anybody <laughs> or, or detain anybody. Um, and, and they have an ear to listen to. And um, my experience is, is, is that if there's enough pressure politically and, and from the bottom up, from the society at large, and also from the legal establishment, uh, regulations change. So what is presented to you as, as, as solid uh, today might actually become something closer to what you're telling them tomorrow. Because again, politics is fluid, but I don't think it's possible to reconcile. I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, in that sense, it is not re really a dialogue, but it's more, um, on our part, at least for my work, understanding how they do it. So I'm, I'm going to give you one example. <clears throat> I was uh, training a, a, a law graduate student, and she was also working as um, um, a woman's rights lawyer uh, for rape cases under custody, right? So when people are taken in, uh, <clears throat> they're raped and they're sexual abuse and then they can't make charges and then and then they do and what happens in in the in the court so she was actively representing clients while also writing on um, <clears throat> legal approaches to sexual violence in court and at one point um, she came very near to collapse because one of the cases that she was really building and she was hoping she'll actually get a decision um, didn't go where she wanted to and she kind of carried that frustration to her graduate work. And she started saying, why am I doing this? Look at the real world, it's not happening. And we had to have this really lengthy discussion on a very uncomfortable subject, which is not emoting. When you're dealing with systemic political violence, you can't emote. When you're dealing with state offices or actually executing decisions that you know are violating other people's lives, you cannot emote. You're not there to emote. You can emote personally, but when you're dealing with them face to face, your place is not to show emotional reaction or anger but try to understand how they justify it, how they document it, how they hide it. Um, so, so never mind reconciling, it's actually a real confrontation in that sense. Because <clears throat> um, unless people like you and I ask these questions, most of these uh, practices go um, silently uh, underneath and they continue. Okay, all right. So do we have on the chat, there's only admonishment to me, um, but uh, no questions, any, questions from the room. Um, well, let me uh, throw out a, a, another kind of um, building on the, what do we do with those bureaucrats? As a former federal bureaucrat myself <laughs> in the federal government of the United States, uh, we would also, oftentimes we wanted to know many things, but you know, as a federal official, my hands are tied. I can't do many things, right? So we would always say to people out there, uh, well, I can't lobby, but you can. Uh, I can't research it, but I can give you money to research it. You know? right. and, and there is that engagement also possible. So I think your point about, you know, not necessarily befriending bureaucrats, but being on good terms with bureaucrats and involving them in, in your work 
is a very important one. Um, my husband has been a bureaucrat for 30 some years working on um, Indian issues. And you know he would always talk the same way Negris talks about, go and give an interview. Because what I can't do as a bureaucrat, I can do off the record with a journalist. You know, I will not let him publish my name, but I will tell them <laughs> what I think they should know. Um, so there, I think there is, I'm sure in Canada, it's the same, you know, thing as yeah. we were, yeah. as we're now talking also about, you know, the prize, the Lisa Gillard pr prize for ISFM. You know, she was the first anthropologist that was on the Canadian Immigration Board, right? So it was also reconciling research with being an official. Um, yeah. This yeah. huge body making all these big decisions. So I think. So, any more questions? I'm talking so you can ask more questions. No. So if if there's no more questions, thank you, Negris. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate it, uh, you making the time. The seagulls were uh, also competing with you. We heard them. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, really very informative. And, um, you know, hopefully this is not, this is our second conversation, right, on the SEBAM uh, webinar. So hopefully not the last. Um, and we will exploit you and traffic you and uh, <laughs> you know, pin you on, on, on many other issues. So um, please join me in, in thanking, there's a clapping uh, away on on zoom <laughs> and my you. student thank you. <laughs> thank you very much um and um have a very nice afternoon you too you too all the best